everyone. My name is Lei Jingma, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. And I'm working with uh, Dr. Raswanis and Professor Kim Vandiver. And, and today I'd like to describe our work on a weighted sparse input neural network technique applied to identify important features for vortex-induced vibration. Um, I think as a lot of people already know that vortex-induced vibration is a classical problem in the field of uh, fluid structure interaction. Uh, it occurs when the flow passes around a free cylinder and uh, the uh, periodic forces will induce the vibration of the flexible cylinders. And uh, um, uh, such a kind of vibration may cause the fatigue damage for these structures. And therefore, building a reliable and accurate model to predict the structural fatigue damage is of great importance. And uh, in this slide, I show a video we recorded in one of our experiments conducted on a 38 meter pipe when it's uh, vibrating in uniform flow. Uh, okay, uh, for such a kind of uh, physics problem, uh, uh, it, uh, um, it, it is actually quite uh, challenging to obtain an ac accurate prediction a lot of physical features may vary during the VIV process. For example, the uh, current profile is not necessarily spatially uniform, and the flow speed in real deep ocean environment can be very high, and which makes the Reynolds number um, can be much greater than 10 to the six. And uh, also, because the structure is a flexible system, so it has an infinite degree of freedom and uh, the vibration pattern could be uh, very different under different currents. And uh, because of these challenges, up to now there is still not a reliable either numerical simulation or uh, empirical predictive models. So uh, uh, most of our work is uh, based on uh, experimental investigations and uh, try to use machine learning to um, build some predictive models. and. Uh, because a lot of features are varying during this process, so um, uh, if we directly apply a machine learning model to co uh, conduct the prediction, we may need a lot of features. Um, however, if we have a lot of features in the model, this may bring us with a lot of inconvenience. Uh, for example, uh, it, this means uh, if we are doing an experiment, we need to design different types of measurements to collect all the required information. And uh, also building a model with too many features may make the interpretation and generalization difficult. Uh, on the other hand, if we ignore a lot of important features, we may take the risk of oversimplifying the model. Um, because of this trade-off between the dimension of the problem uh, versus the predictive ability, our objective is to solve a problem where we are given the experimental measurement of some of the structural vibration information. And we want to use machine learning to help us identify the most important physical features for VIV response prediction. Um, to solve this kind of problem, there could be several strategies. Uh, the most direct one is to uh, is called a, a is a brute force combinatorial search. Uh, in this uh, method, we can uh, test different hypotheses. Uh, we can import different feature subset to the neural network, and uh, the output of the neural network will give us the error for the corresponding input feature set. And then we can compare the prediction error among all the hypotheses. And, but this kind of approach can be often computationally expensive. Uh, for example, if we have P features, and, and doing this kind of uh, brute force search requires uh, two to the P times predictions. Um, in order to accelerate the um, uh, uh, prediction uh, uh, in, in, in order to accelerate the prediction and at the same time finding sparse solutions, an alternative method is directly embed the sparsity promoting techniques inside the neural network optimization. 
And one of these strategies is called a sparse input neural network. And uh, in this slide, I use capital P to denote the total number of input features and capital M to represent the number of neurons in the first hidden layer. And I also grouped all the weights uh, outgoing from the same input feature as a weight group. The magnitude of the weight group is measured by the, uh, sorry, the magnitude of, uh, the magnitude of the weight group is uh, measured by the, uh, the sum of the squares of the weights. And ideally, we want to solve a problem of minimizing the prediction error and at the same time limit the number of uh, input features. Uh, on the neural network implementation side, this means we can impose a regularization just in between the first uh, just in between the uh, input layer and the first hidden layer. And uh, um, uh, we can, uh, th this means we, we, we can limit the number of, no, uh, w limit the number of weight groups which has non-zero magnitude. And, uh, but this kind of constraint is not convex. So a commonly used convex approximation is to uh, constrain them a sum of the magnitude for all the weight groups. And this kind of uh, approximation can be equivalently expressed as uh, an objective with, uh, with an addition of a bias term. And the lambda is a hyperparameter which can adjust the level of bias versus the prediction accuracy. Uh, for example, if we increase the lambda, um, the uh, optimization well to try more to minimize the sum of the weight groups and therefore more weight groups are expected to shrink to zero. Uh, however, in this kind of approach, we are applying the same level of uh, uh, constraint for all the input features. Uh, but in a lot of physics prob uh, but in a lot of physics problems, uh, we may uh, have uh, some prior knowledge of the f physics. For example, in fluid mechanics problems, we, we from dimensional analysis, we uh, can obtain that the Reynolds number is an important parameter. So in order to differentiate the prior knowledge uh, with the additional important features, uh, here we modify the ob objective of the neural network and uh, the, uh, the modified optimization is written as follows, where we assign different weights, SP and SA, for the uh, prior knowledge subset and the additional feature subset. And because we have higher confidence for the prior knowledge, uh, so we, the uh, SP should be set as a much smaller value compared to SA. And in this way, we can prevent the prior knowledge from being removed in the feature selection process. And okay, now we have uh, this, uh, investigated different types of feature selection techniques. And then I try to apply some of these techniques to help me identify important features for flexible cylinders vortex-induced vibration. And um, so first I will describe the relevant features for flexible cylinders VIV modeling. Uh, um, the figure in this slide shows a sketch of a tension el elastic cylinder under a linearly sheared floor in space. Um, the current will cause the cylinder to vibrate in two uh, directions, which are inline and uh, cross flow directions with respect to the incoming flow. And uh, the, because the uh, cylinder is an elastic system, so we can approximate its vibration um, as the vibration of an uh, tension Euler Bernoulli beam. And uh, all the parameters on the left-hand side are used to describe the uh, structural properties, which include the mass uh, damping uh, tension and bending stiffness while the forcing on the left hand, on the right hand side are the vortex induced forces um, in the cross flow and inline directions. Uh, uh, and uh, from a lot of previous analysis, it was known that the forcing is a 
result of complicated of uh, interaction between the structural response and the uh, uh, vortex shedding. So, uh, uh, but that uh, uh, formulate the exact formulation is not known. So, uh, with, with all, uh, instead of deriving complicated mathematical formulations, we uh, try to parameterize the forcing as a function of the system properties as well as the measured structural response. And because the measured structural response in the inline and cross flow directions has spatially, uh, has complicated spatial temporal distributions, we then try to uh, uh, use some, uh, we then try to uh, apply some uh, signal processing techniques to reduce the dimension of the problem. Oh, okay. Uh, in this slide, uh, I present some of the measured uh, vibration signals in a flexible cylinder uh, vibrating in a linearly sheared current profile. And from the vibra um, and uh, for each vibration signal, I conducted a wavelet analysis. And uh, from the wavelet analysis, we can see that uh, um, the a vibration, the typical vibration is a narrow banded process and it has a dominant frequency. Um, yeah, uh, it, uh, it has a dominant vibration frequency. Um, uh, besides the temporal property, I also try to uh, describe the spatial distribution using some empirical model de uh, decomposition. And uh, for each uh, snapshot in space and time of the measured response signal, I uh, conducted a proper orthogonal decomposition um, to uh, express the response as a superposition of the POD modes and uh, their mode participation factors. Uh, however, for the response, it, uh, it is not a standing wave. So for each POD mode, we need two standing wave typed mode uh, to describe its spatial distribution. And um, uh, then I compare the, uh, mag uh, the energy of the dominant POD mode over the total POD mode uh, to, and define that ratio as the mode participation factor. Uh, as, th as this fa uh, factor approaches to one, this suggests the vibration process is single mode dominated. While um, on the other hand, if uh, this kappa is approaching to zero, this means the vibration process involves a lot of um, um, mode participation. And uh, here's an example of the result of the um, mode participation factor analyzed in a, a spatial temporal, uh, uh, for, for each, uh, space and time uh, for each snapshot in space and time as uh, pointed out in the red box. And we can see that the uh, mode participation factor is close to one, which suggests uh, for most of the time, the vibration is uh, dominated by the single POD mode. Uh, and we also know that the uh, mode is not just a standing wave. So I also try to characterize whether the vibration is standing wave or not by comparing the magnitude um, of the two components in the dominant POD mode. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, th th this technique is uh, first applied in one of uh, these papers. And uh, uh, when the traveling wave index is uh, approaching to one, this suggests um, the vibration is uh, is a traveling has uh, some traveling wave components, uh, while as, uh, when the traveling wave index is approaching to zero, this means the vibration is just dominated by the standing wave. And uh, a typical VIV signal um, may have a variation of traveling waves over time. Um, okay, now we have conducted some uh, VIV modeling and uh, uh, some signal processing. So we can obtain a list of 18 VIV features that describe the uh, system properties as well as the global vibration response metric. So the left, the left hand side of this uh, uh, slide shows the 
uh, main uh, VIV system properties. Um, for example, we use the Reynolds number and the shear parameter to describe the uh, uh, velocity and the, uh, to describe the velocity of the flow and the spatial gradient of the current. And also some of the other features are used to describe the dimensionless structural properties. While on the right hand side are mainly uh, some of the designed global VIV response metric, which involves the uh, spatially temporary uh, average response amplitude and damping parameter. And we also uh, 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 pr uh, non-dimensionalize the vibration frequency in terms of the reduced velocity. And the last four rows are the uh, mode dominance factors and the traveling wave index used to describe the spatial distribution of the VIV response in detail. Um, so now we, we have uh, obtained uh, several uh, several uh, uh, relevant features, and then I will try to use the feature selection techniques to further reduce the dimension. Um, so the data set I looked at is an experiment that we conducted on a 38 meter pipe towed in the ocean basin. And in that experiment, um, uh, we studied two different types of pipes with different diameters. And uh, the pipe is uh, um, um, uh, studied in a both uniform flow and linearly shared uh, environment. And the flow speed varies over a wide range, makes the Reynolds number varying from order of 10 to the 4 to order of 10 to the 5. And uh, in that experiment, we use uh, strain gauges and accelerometers to monitor the structural vibration. Uh, and then after, the, uh, um, after obtaining those signals, we analyze those key VIV features over each three cross-flow vibration period. And we treat each of those signals as a data sample for machine learning prediction. And then is the uh, set up for our machine learning model. Uh, and the output of concern is, the, uh, is designed the, to be the cross flow response amplitude, while the rest of the 17 uh, global features for VIV are used as the input. And uh, we used a, a neural network model with uh, two hidden layers. And uh, for each hidden layer, we have 20 neurons. And, um, and our objective is to minimize the mean absolute percentage error. But if we are applying weighted sparse input neural network, um, we need to add uh, two additional terms uh, in the loss function. And the SA and SP uh, used in the prediction are said to be 1 and 0.02. OK, as for the prior knowledge, uh, we make use of, uh, of our um, experimental investigations from a much simpler setup, which is the VIV for the rigid cylinders. And uh, a lot of uh, experimental investigations of VIV for rigid cylinders have found that the increasing of the damping for this kind of system will effectively uh, decrease the response amplitude, while the increase of the Reynolds number will uh, also uh, add us well, well, at the same time, the increase of the Reynolds number will try to uh, increase the response amplitude. And uh, therefore, we use the damping parameter C star and Reynolds number uh, as our prior knowledge. And uh, we, uh, on top of these two, we also include the shear parameter because for flexible cylinders experiments, uh, the, uh, the shear par parameter can vary depending on whether the flow is uniform or linearly shear. OK, and this slide is the main result of our uh, weighted sparse input neural network uh, algorithm. And um, the uh, top of this figure shows uh, the remaining, uh, the black blocks in the top of the figure shows the remaining features identified from weighted sparse input neural network at each level of lambda. Uh, as lam for example, as 
if we set a very small value for lambda, uh, all the features uh, uh, will not be zeros, so they will remain in the neural network prediction. Uh, in this case, the prediction accuracy is around 10%. Uh, so uh, so th this result can be used as our baseline prediction. But if we increase the magnitude for lambda, uh, more and more features will be uh, shrink to zero. And, uh, uh, and finally, if we have a very large lambda, all the features except the prior knowledge will be removed. And the bottom figure shows the corresponding variation of the error with, as a function of the number of features. And we can find that as we remove more information, the uh, prediction accuracy is going to decrease. But we can find from, the, uh, from this kind of variation, if, if we use a feature subset containing five features, which includes the three prior knowledge uh, uh, combined with inline vibration amplitude, as well as uh, mode dominance factor in a cross flow direction, uh, the prediction accuracy is quite close to the prediction accuracy obtained from 17 features. Uh, and as a comparison, we also try to uh, uh, get the uh, prediction error using uh, the brute force combinatorial search and the results are shown in the red blocks and we can compare the prediction error uh, between the two approaches and find that the two approaches can give almost identical minimum prediction error at in each level of uh, sparsity and now we have constructed a predictive model made up of uh, five features and, uh, and the model can give us with a good prediction accuracy but uh, only uh, obtaining the uh, accuracy is not enough for uh, for us to understand the physical insight uh, we also need to study the uh, contribution of each of the features for the output and we, in this slide uh, how i did this physical interpretation is by uh, constraining some of the uh, input features to a constant value and study the variation of the output as a function of uh, some of the varying inputs. For example, the contour plot on the left-hand side is the uh, res uh, predicted response amplitude, while the x and y axis are the varying amount of damping and Reynolds number. And we can find that in our flexible cylinder uh, machine learning model, the um, uh, amplitude has also well, has a decreasing trend with the increasing amount of damping. And uh, the Reynolds number effect is also very significant, especially when the damping is very low. And these kind of relationships are also in, uh, consistent with the experimental results uh, from a lot of rigid cylinder experiments. And uh, furthermore, I also studied the correlations between the cr uh, cross flow amplitude and the inline amplitude, as well as the mode dominance factor in the cross flow direction. And uh, we can also obtain similar um, relationships as the rigid cylinder experiment. For example, um, the uh, cross flow amplitude will has will have a increasing trend with the inline amplitude and um, moreover the uh, machine learning model also suggests that the uh, whether the mode is single whether the response is single mode dominated or not uh, the vibration amplitude predicted by this model will also be affected and finally is our conclusion for this work um, first, we modify the sparse input neural network technique um, by differentiating the importance of prior knowledge and uh, additional features. Uh, in this way, we can efficiently select additional important features that complement the prior knowledge. And secondly, 
um, we apply this algorithm to some of the experimental measurements of VIV for the flexible cylinders. And the results shows that on top of the prior knowledge, which include Reynolds number, shear parameter, and damping parameter, the um, feature selection algorithm was able to reduce the 14 additional parameters to just two additional important parameters. And uh, the, the result uh, uh, can uh, um, um, give us uh, some new insights for the flexible cylinder VIV process. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lejin. Uh, we have time for questions from the group. I have one. So how did you do the optimization? And was it sensitive in terms of effort or efficiency with the, the lambda parameter? Um, um, I tried different optimization techniques like a, um, uh, um, um, like I, I, uh, I think uh, um, uh, um, I think uh, uh, the result is not very sensitive to the uh, optimization technique. I tried different techniques, which include uh, a technique called FTIL and uh, also another technique like. Uh, uh, a traditional atom optimizer, they both give very similar results. Um, and the lambda are chosen uh, uh, between two extreme conditions. One ex extreme condition is that uh, all the features uh, are not removed. And uh, the other extreme is uh, uh, um, all the features except the prior knowledge is removed. Yeah, so something even you were able to use something like Adam and still get a, I mean, you didn't have to use a special or not necessarily use a special L1 type minimization algorithm. Uh, not necessary, yeah. Okay. And I guess one other question I was wondering, this was a relatively, well, relatively uh, simple network mm -hmm. and do you think it'll scale well to other types of networks? There's no reason why you couldn't apply it, uh, I guess. This. Yeah, I think it can also scale to more um, difficult networks like a CNN. And all, all what you need to do is just apply, uh, uh, all what you need to do is just apply a regularization between the input layer and the first hidden layer. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so you were only doing it on the first layer. You didn't cascade yeah. it through. Okay. Yeah. 